Listening to Big Blue Shots Podcast. Hello again and welcome to another Horror Shots Podcast with me, Casey. Of course, this podcast is brought to you by the wonderful people over at MorbidlyBeautiful.com. If you have any interest in anything pop culture related in terms of horror, you have to go check out MorbidlyBeautiful.com. They have a ton of great interviews, retrospectives, reviews, top 10 lists, anything you want, they have it. In fact, they just put an interview up with none other than Art the Clown, David Howard Thornton. It's definitely worth a read, and I suggest you go check it out as soon as you can. Also, I was contacted by a guy who runs a very interesting website. His name is Steve, and he runs a website called thingsifear.com. Now, I suggest go checking this out as well for one simple reason. It is interesting as all hell, and I mean that. His top ten lists about different fears. He has information on different phobias, and it's just unique. I've never seen anything like it. So go check it out if you have any interest in phobias, fears, and what he thinks about, you know, everyday life in terms of what's scary from anything to hobbies and jobs to just walking down the street. Everybody's got fears. Maybe go find out a little bit more about your own. Lastly, in this little piece of housekeeping, I do have to mention the contest. This is the last podcast that you can enter to win some merch or a photography print or whatever your little heart desires. That's right. This is the very last week, meaning if you leave a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or even Stitcher, you were entered into a draw to win something cool. And who doesn't like cool stuff? That is, again, on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or Stitcher, you will be entered into a draw to win something really fun. And if you do leave a review, be sure to send me an email at horrorshotspodcast at gmail.com so I can get your information. In case you are the winner, I have somewhere to send the stuff. Next week, I will announce who the winner is. It's pretty exciting. But on to the podcast itself this week. We are continuing on with our tour of the United States, the eerie United States. What does that mean? Well, if you've listened to the last couple of weeks, I've been going over a few different states and their urban legends and things that they're kind of known for or maybe not so known for in terms of scariness, weirdness, oddities, creepiness, whatever you want to call it. And today, we are traveling to the southern state of Arkansas. Now, Arkansas is a very interesting place as there seems to be a lot of paranormal activity, a lot of hauntings, especially on roads and highways, and certain landmarks. Although I couldn't find any super in-depth detail on any of these legends, which leads me to believe that they're more traditional urban legends in the sense that they have morals and things that you should avoid in order to not get caught. Think old folklore, where you'd be told not to cross the street or take candy from strangers because you could be taken or something along those lines, something that has a moral to it. But regardless, they are still very interesting. There are plenty of them. So this podcast is going to be a little bit different in that sense. So as opposed to looking at just one thing this episode, I'm going to be looking at a multitude of things. Not quite a top 10 list, just sort of a rundown and a little bit of synopsis of everything that I found so far in terms of Arkansas legends. And we're going to start with One of the more creepy ones, I must say, and it's the Phantom Hitchhiker on Highway 365 in Woodson. Everybody knows of the Phantom Hitchhiker. It's a story that travels from town to town just like a hitchhiker would. I think most small towns or rural settings will have something similar to this, but the story goes there's a man or a woman or somebody traveling down Highway 365 in the middle of the night. And what do they see out of the corner of their eye but a little girl standing there? Now, of course, this always takes place during a rainy time or in a cooler season, such as fall or nearing winter. And the girl is dressed with nothing but a dress or a nightgown or something along those lines. And she looks cold. So the driver stops and pulls over. He picks her up. He asks where she's going and she gives him an address. And because she looks cold, he lends her a jacket. Now, they drive to this address and drop the little girl off. But standing in the driveway is a parent, and the parent goes, oh, you found her. And the driver responds with, yeah, she was on the middle of the road. I had to stop and pick her up. It was only 
fair, it was the right thing to do. The parent thanks him, and he says, well, why was she out in the middle of the road, in the middle of the night? What happened? And that's when the parent responds with, this is my daughter. She died in a car accident last year. And on the anniversary of her death, every year, she tries to come back home. And ultimately, somebody does pick her up and brings her back. I have to get her to bed now. And then the two walk off and seemingly disappear into the night. Later on, the driver goes to a cemetery and finds the girl's gravestone. And there it is, with the jacket he had lent her, laying on the ground beside the tombstone. That is probably something that you have heard before, right? maybe a campfire story, or on a TV show such as Supernatural, or Are You Afraid of the Dark, or Goosebumps, or something along those lines. It's been covered before, and I had a very familiar sense about it when I first read it, and it's very creepy. It's a very odd story, but it also has that sort of moral attached to it as well, as if you shouldn't go pick up strangers in the middle of the night, even if they are children, for it could be a ghost, or it could be detrimental to you. Also, it could also mean don't let your kids play in the middle of a highway, no matter how rural you think it might be. We all saw Pet Cemetery. We know what happens to the children in those movies. Let's just say it involves a truck on a highway. That's all I have to say. Next up, I do have something called the Tilly Willy Bridge. Now, despite this bridge being demolished a little while ago, the legend does live on. As the story goes, a woman drove off the bridge some 40 years ago, killing herself and her children. Now the ghostly car was spotted driving across the bridge, and the ghost woman herself is said to haunt the area, despite the bridge being gone. Again, I've heard multiple variations of this bridge story, uh, the Tilly Willy Bridge in particular. So some say it is a story that lives on through generations, that grandparents tell it to their kids and their kids in turn tell it to them. So it's a few generations old, which doesn't lend a whole lot of credence to it, other than it being a moral story again. Now, some people say it's a woman from the 50s driving a 50s-style car who got into an argument or distracted or something by her kid and then drove off this very narrow bridge into the river below and causing them both to die. Others say it was a man in the 70s driving when his two kids in the back began to argue and he turned around to break it up. Well, that happened to take place over the Tilly Willy Bridge as well, where the car flew off the handles and into the water below, killing everybody inside. This story does seem to have a few new iterations every decade or so, having one in the 50s, 70s, maybe even the 90s at this point. And the moral, again, of this story would be that pay attention when you're driving. Arguments are going to happen, and, you know, just pay attention, look ahead. It could also be another metaphor for drinking and driving, and don't do it. Anything bad could happen when you are not 100% focused on the road. And I guess today we could talk about cell phones being a distraction or something along those lines. Other than that, it has been reported that these ghostly apparitions do appear near where this Tilly Willy Bridge used to be, despite it not being there anymore. I suppose the apparition of a car doesn't really exist anymore as there's nothing to drive on, but it is a ghost, a phantom, if you will. So it doesn't really adhere to the natural rules of this earth, I guess you could say. Continuing on with our little mini tour through Arkansas, we have in the beautiful city of Eureka Springs, the Crescent Hotel. And if you are interested in the paranormal, this is the place to go, if you're in Arkansas anyway. The hotel itself has been deemed the most haunted hotel in America, and you can actually stay there. Now, the place does offer ghost tours and has a rich history, which you can learn all about when you book a tour with them. And if you do want to stay the night, you absolutely can. And there's also the possibility that you will meet the ghost in the morgue or the woman who is said to linger in room 3500. Seems like this place has a lot of hauntings and a lot of goings on. And if you are interested in staying the night with a possible ghost, this is the place to do it. It's Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs. And I was able to find a little bit more information about this hotel as well from a website called crescent-hotel.com. And this is from a blog post that they posted a little while back, a couple of years ago now. When Marty and Elise Rodick purchased a Crescent Hotel in 1997, they inherited a confused association with the paranormal and what seemed to be a hundred years worth of ghost stories. 
At that time, years before the TAPS team of the popular sci-fi network show, Ghost Hunters, paid a visit to them, many hotel owners might have hesitated to publicize the fact that their establishment was haunted. But the Rognicks were interested and decided to take a different approach. That path was to restore the hotel as a destination spa resort, but also pursue what many had claimed. The 1886 Crescent Hotel was America's most haunted hotel. A key part of that early pursuit included Mr. Rognick's pursuing and hiring two certified mediums, Ken Fuggett and Carol Heath, both of San Francisco, and they hired them to read the building. Their findings, plus the startling number of repeated sightings that have been recorded over the decades, became the basis of what has become the nightly Crescent Hotel ghost tour. It is only now, however, that the most compelling discoveries from that initial reading have become ever so clear. Jack Moyer, hotel general manager for the Rognick era, recounted, quote, I clearly remember Carol Heath stating that he had discovered a portal to the other side, for those who are on the same frequency anyway. Moyer, a skeptic at the time, laughed and continued, I quote, I remember asking myself, what were we thinking? trying to explore this unexplained world. But after more than a decade of working around the paranormal, I now assuredly recognize how many people truly connect to the spirits here at the Crescent. And there's a new and specific reason why. Moyer's reason is the fact that after 18 years, he has been confronted with the realm of a chilling coincidence that caused the original portal discovery to resurface. It started with dialogue involving Moyer and the current hotel ghost tour manager Keith Scales. Quote, Keith came to me with a shared concern about a phenomenon that had been reoccurring on these nightly tours. That phenomenon included multiple guests who had grown faint, with a few passing out briefly, at the same tour stop with no reasonable explanation. Then Scales described the location, and it was the area that had been identified as a portal more than a decade ago by Heath. Scales then took me to the place and pinpointed the portal phenomenon as happening just outside the hotel's annex entrance, exactly where Heath had identified the location of his portal years ago. This phenomenon has guests suddenly turning pale, falling against, and then sliding down the wall in a faint. Although the loss of consciousness does not last very long, and complete recovery is immediate, it tends to farther substantiate the hotel's legendary supernatural connection with the paranormal. Moyer went on to say, quote, What made that moment most chilling was when Keith and I realized that this portal was directly above the morgue located on the bottom level of the hotel. Now in its 17th year, the ghost tour of the 1886 Crescent Hotel continues to increase in popularity. That's 17 years, four years ago, so it's in its 21st year if it's still operating today. The legend continues to grow as yet another phenomenon is recognized, one that occurs with uncanny frequency about every couple weeks or so. Scales added, what makes it legendary is that it seems to rise up in a vertical plane from the notorious Norman Baker morgue. It should be noted that the Norman Baker from Miscanti purchased the hotel in 1937 and operated it as a quote-unquote cancer-curing hospital until late 1939 when he was arrested for mail fraud. Scales was quick to point out that the Crescent Hotel is super cautious about accepting events as supernatural. He stated that 95% of reported paranormal phenomena can be explained by normal means, but there is always a residue, maybe 5% of experiences that defy explanation. We don't know why some people have a tendency to faint at this particular place. We only know that they do at the place where activity of various kinds have been reported over the decades, Scales went on to say. Both Moyer and Scales agree that the curious fact is that this event has never been known to occur anywhere else on the tour except at this one specific location a location that sits directly above the infamous morgue. Goes on to add here, whether there are portals to other realities here at the 1886 Crescent Hotel or not, no one can say, confirm, nor deny that these things are paranormal. It is all part of the mystery, unexplained happenings of America's most haunted hotel. Now the last one I want to touch on here is more of a cryptozoological find than anything else. Kind of like Bigfoot, but closer to the Loch Ness Monster. Yes, apparently Arkansas has its own Loch Ness Monster, which is kind of cool if you think about it. Now, the legend started in about 1915 when local farmers began filing reports of a large unknown creature off the banks of the White River. That's in Newport, Arkansas. In July 1937, a key eyewitness account 
described the creature as having gray skin and being as wide as a car and three cars long. A county deputy said the creature itself looked like a large sturgeon or catfish. That wasn't for years until it was spotted again in 1971. That year, eyewitnesses who encountered the creature described it as the size of a boxcar with a bone protruding from its forehead. Quote, it looked as if the thing was peeling all over, but it was a smooth type of skin or flesh, and it made a strange noise that sounded like a combination of a cow's moo and a horse's neigh. Other accounts of the White River Monster describe three-toed tracks, 14 inches in length, on Townhead Island leading down to the river through a path of bent trees and crushed bushes. Following the reports in 1973, the Arkansas State Legislator created the White River Monster Refuge, making it illegal to, quote, molest, kill, trample, or harm the White River Monster while he is in his retreat. Which is a weird sort of thing to pass in law. I guess they're stranger, but eh, whatever. It's good that they're trying to protect that sort of land and creature, if there is one. A lot of people do, though, think that it is a case of mistaken identity. According to scientists, the White River Monster is likely a case of mistaken identity. Cryptozoologist and biologist Roy P. Mackle has suggested that the creature is a clear-cut instance of a known aquatic animal outside its normal habitat or range and therefore unidentified by the observers unfamiliar with this type. Mackel believes that this creature is in fact a large male elephant seal that has wandered up the Mississippi River into the White River. Measuring an average of 5,000 pounds and 14 feet in length, a male elephant seal shares many of the characteristics described by those who've encountered the monster. Gray skin, three toed tracks, summer molting, and farm animals calls, even though the bone on the creature's forehead can be explained by the male elephant seal's inflatable trunk. So are male elephant seals really visiting the White River? Well, no one's been able to confirm that they are, and the mystery does continue. There are some comments on this article, and I'm going to read a few of them. This one comes from a fella named Robert. He says, A recent buddy of mine, my son and myself, experienced a very large, long creature on top of the water over at Old Prairie Creek on Beaver Lake. As I was researching any known sightings of giant creatures in Arkansas waters, the White River monster popped up. So things are still being seen to this day. Well, this decade, anyway. This does seem to be a typical case of a cryptozoological creature kind of being mistaken for something else. A lot of people do believe that is how these myths and legends start, when somebody sees something that they're just not sure about. From dragons to demons and everything in between, that is generally the case when it comes to unidentified or unknown creatures. It is a little bit sad that the imagination and the magic in the world is kind of dissipating to make way for science, but we also want to make sure that we know exactly what is going on out there. I understand the skeptics, and I understand the believers. It's really fun, and it's really interesting to want to discover something new and prove that these so-called imaginary beasts exist. But that's just a story for another podcast, I suppose, going over the difference between fact and fiction, reality and imagination or fantasy. Regardless, that does bring us to the end of our little tour of Arkansas. I hope you enjoyed it, and again, don't forget to leave a review. If you do, you are entered into a draw to win something pretty cool. So until next week, when we continue on with our tour of the eerie United States.